I'm going to move things right along uh, and ask Charlotte O'Brien to tell us about how biochar plays a part in all of these biological processes we're learning about. Hi. Can you hear me? Is this good? Okay. That's right. Yep. So, carbon drawdown. As we know, photosynthesis draws carbon out of the atmosphere. But what keeps it out of the atmosphere is the process called pyrolysis, from which we make biochar. So if you take any plant material, doesn't matter if it's trees or corn stalks or whatever, and you pyrolyze it, which means you raise it to a high temperature, about 500 degrees Celsius is ideal, under no oxygen. So you're driving out the gases of the, of the biomass, and you're left with the uh, structure of the plant. So 50% of the carbon that was in the plant is now in the biochar, and 50% is available for gases to be made into electricity or pyrolysis oil. So you can do it simply, as in Cambodia, this is, a, this is a bamboo made into biochar, a little closer up in a very simple oven. Oh, I can see here. Or you can use very complicated equipment. This is a slow paralysis, a high-tech system. Very expensive, but very nice biochar. Um, this is even a bigger system. It's also slow paralysis. So feedstocks, you can use anything. You know, rice straw, which is currently being burned primarily, or miscanthus, which is a purpose-grown biomass, or of course bamboo, which has many purposes besides just making biochar. You've got leftover sawdust, you've got grain mills that have residue crop, and lots and lots of different types of biomass. So biochar is basically a very high-grade charcoal, um, depending on how it's made. So its purpose is to act both mechanically and biologically on soils. And you can see by, the, by a blow up of biochar why it does that. It has a lot of um, surface area and it has a lot of uh, interaction with, with biology. So the United Nations says it's an imperative that we use biochar for the purpose of, of agriculture. Um, and one reason is because we need food security. The other reason is that Chemical agriculture is responsible for 35% of our greenhouse gases. Now that is absolutely insane. We are poisoning ourselves and the earth in order to grow food, which makes no sense at all, and it's a big source of stopping our greenhouse emissions. I mean, 35%, we certainly, if we move to organics, to sustainable, to regenerative agriculture, we can stop those emissions and live a healthier life. So biochar was, was um, actually discovered in the 1800s in the Amazon. And actually in the 1500s, the Spaniards first went there and noticed that they'd go down the Amazon, nasty yellow soil, things didn't grow very well, and they came to these wonderful civilizations with this beautiful black soil, and they thought, wow, what's going on here? And they could see the civilization was very, very advanced, and they had started out with this very bad soil and built it up over, obviously, millennia until they were able to be a very advanced civilization. So it, is, it still exists today, it's, the, it's a very valuable soil. You can see this is an example of, of the different types of production on it. In, um, excuse me, I'm going pretty fast. In Cameron, they, they did experiments on corn crops, and you can see in the young man's right hand the beautiful root system that both T and Tom have been talking about, as opposed, that was grown with biochar. And the, and the left, of course, is grown without biochar. In, um, in um, Senegal, a group called Pro Natura is helping people grow 100 tons of vegetables per acre using biochar. And of course, you're around growing. So in terms of climate change, biochar has many, many uses. One is that it makes soil, it holds more water just because it absorbs water. So it holds more water when, when the heavy rains come as they do with climate change. And then it also, when the, when the drought comes, as it inevitably does, working with the soil bacteria and the mycorrhizal fungi, it transfers, it helps to, helps the soil biology to transfer water to the plant during a drought. So water is, is tightly held in soils as the drought comes on, but the, the mycorrhizal fungi are, have as many as uh, 12,000 miles of roots of hyphae in a cubic yard of soil. 12,000 miles. So it goes into every nook and cranny, thank you, and is able to bring water back to the plant. 
Biochar also has many filtration uses. <clears throat> My favorite one is village level water filtration, air filtration. Um, China just recently admitted that one fifth of all their soils is, are polluted. We don't admit it, but we have a lot of polluted soils too. I'm from Hawaii where the pineapple industry just left us with terribly polluted soil where things won't even grow. Luckily, biochar at only one ton per acre, dissed in to eight inches, can absorb not only heavy metals, but also um, things like organochlorides, the old DDT type families. It can absorb them, immobilize them, make them inactive, and then over time the bacteria can then break them down. This is an example in Colorado, Hope Mines. This mine sat this way for 60 years, 13 months after biochar with microbes. It looked like this. In New Zealand, they have 50,000 sites where they did um, sheep dipping with DDT and now they have polluted sites and they have found that they can use biochar with microbes to bring those sites back to fertility. There are lots of different ways you can make it in your backyard. These are little stoves. You can find lots of them on the internet. You can buy them, you can make them, you can uh, use them. A lot of people are making biochar. You can use them to heat your home and get biochar out of it. This is a commercial unit made in over three miles, three hours from here in New York that you could use to heat a greenhouse. You can take the thermal energy off. So the important thing with biochar, though, is that you inoculate it. You don't just take it out there and throw it in those fields, as so many researchers have done, which has given us this mix of results from biochar because people have not been using it correctly. Hopefully, we're past that stage, but, and now we know that we have to, I didn't bring my glasses, but we need to mineralize, we need to moisten, microize, mineralize, and microbial, uh, you know, inoculate it. You can buy it on the internet. It's very readily available. It's very expensive. Um, you, you shouldn't be paying, well, it, it's expensive. And the big, reason, the big reason that biochar is so important is this plant, the, the mycorrhiza fungi. That's what actually does the drawing down of the carbon. You have some carbon, of course, sequestered in the biochar, but more importantly, you get that secondary drawdown by in getting the, the microbes going again. And it's just a, it's kind of a kickstarting the microbes. So in the long run, we're looking at a, you know, a process. It's a cumulative, uh, like a, a positive feedback loop where we're drawing down carbon, making more biomass, drawing down more carbon. Do I have a minute to show a couple more slides? Okay, so here's some really great slides from Australia. These are two pastures side by side. Two brothers own these pastures. You dig down on each side of that fence. From one side, you have very poor, very poor carbon. Dig down the other side already, you can see the soil is much blacker. Dig down deeper, it's much, much blacker. <clears throat> and um, the only difference is the type of farming. One is chemical farming, one is sustainable farming. And the, the soil with the dark carbon is sequestering 37 tons of CO2 per hectare per year. That's an amazing amount. 37 tons per hectare per year. If we could do that every place, we'd have no climate change issues. It's a matter of changing our agricultural preferences and practices. Okay, I did it. Sure. <laughs>